Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentation, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st and 2nd and 3rd John, Jude, Revelation. Good job. Very good job. All right, let's see. She's got it in her mouth, so let's do our list little light. <coughs> it doesn't say don't stick it in your mouth. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine all the time. Let it shine. Don't let the devil it out. I'm going to let it shine. Don't let the devil it out. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine all the time. Let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No. I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine all the time. Let it shine. There it is. I see it now. Good job. Um, in the land of Canaan, Jacob had 12 sons. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Zebulun, Issachar, and Asher, Naphtali, and Dan, Joseph, Gad, and Benjamin. Um, we'll do kings in a little bit. Okay. Genesis, or no, not Genesis card anymore. Acts card. Okay, you ready? Let's go through the first ones pretty quick that you guys know very well. Right? Acts chapter 1 is? Ascension. Ascension. Acts chapter 2? Acts chapter 3? Lame man. Lame man. Good job. Acts chapter 4? Arrested. Arrested. Acts chapter 5? Good job. Acts chapter 6? 7? Good job. Acts chapter 7? Stephen. Stephen. Acts chapter 8? Two, two names. Very good. Acts chapter 9. Saul. Saul. Acts chapter 10. Cornelius. Okay, that's where we stopped last week, but you guys should know most of the rest of these. So we'll add three for tonight. Okay? Acts chapter 11. You remember what it is? Nope. Nope. Christians. Very good. Why is Acts chapter 11 the key word Christians? The first time they were in Antioch, the first time they were called Christians. First time we see followers of Jesus called Christians is in Acts chapter 11. Okay, so Acts chapter 12. Nope. You're not going to find it reading it. Keywords, not titles. Acts chapter 12. Herod. Herod. Who was Herod? He was the king of Judah. You're right. And we're not quite there yet. But, but that will happen later on in Acts. So in Acts chapter 12 is the first time that we are introduced to Herod. Okay? Well, not the first time, but he's the main player in Acts chapter 12. Do what? Maybe it is this Herod, the first time. Um, okay, Acts chapter 13. It is the first missionary journey. So in Acts chapter 13, it'll be the first missionary journeys. How many missionary journeys are there of the Apostle Paul? Three. 
3. And this is number 1. So Acts chapter 11 was what? Christian. Christian. Okay, everybody say at the same time. Acts chapter 11 is? Christian. Christian. Acts chapter 12 is? Herod. Herod. Everybody say it together. Acts chapter 12 is? Herod. Herod. Acts chapter 13 is? Everybody at the same time. Acts chapter 13 is? First missionary journey. Very, very good. Okay. All right. You got your sword? Get your sword. You need a sword? You got a sword. You need a sword? We've got swords. We come prepared. Okay. Are you ready? Remember, at the same time that we're looking up these verses or the chapters in your sword, be very gentle with your sword. You want to be very, very gentle with God's Word. Okay, so first one is going to be ooh, Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. And Daniel is the first one to find it. I got a feeling that you probably got like a bookmark in Daniel. You got it? He's just fast, isn't he? Have you memorized Daniel? Oh. Because you've opened up to it a lot. Yeah, I understand that. I understand that. So here's your challenge, Daniel. Memorize the book of Daniel. There's your challenge. Okay, everybody got it? Everybody got it? Raise your hand if you got it. Daniel? Daniel? Okay, we're getting fewer and fewer in the... Uh, in the audience out here so we got to step up our game a little bit all right next one is judges chapter nine judges chapter nine. boy you are just on point tonight today judges chapter nine it's after judges chapter eight you got it was I right? Was it after chapter 8? Yeah. Judges chapter 8. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. Judges chapter 9. Got it? Y'all got it? Oh, looky there. Almost, 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 almost. Oh, you got it. I see it right there. You got it. Good job. Good job, guys. Okay, last one. You ready? Close your Bible. Last one. Uh, that's too easy. Cheater. Second Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians 5. Good job. Good job, Audie. She got it. Good job, Miranda. Good job, good job. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. My Bible opens up really easy to 1 Corinthians these days. I've been doing a little bit of studying in 1 Corinthians lately. 2 Corinthians 5. Y'all got it? Raise your hand if you got it. That's better. Good job. Good job. All right. I think all we got, we got kings. You ready for kings? Okay. You can set your swords down. You can put your swords down. Good job. You guys were so gentle with your Bibles. Good job. All right, here we go. Rehoboam, Abijah, Asa, Jehoshaphat, Jehoram, Ahaziah, Athaliah, Joash, 
Amaziah, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, Manasseh, Ammon, Josiah, Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, Jehoachin, Zedekiah. Good job. Tell me, raise your hand if you know the definition of true success. Mr. Adi, what is true success? I will bring it over. Living your life and going to heaven. That's right. Living your life, a faithful and obedient life and going to heaven. Raise your hand if you know the definition of true failure. True failure. We're going to go to Eliana. True failure. So, is it living your life? Is that right? And not going to heaven. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Good job. Okay. What, in the beginning, did God create? Mr. Jace? Well, that's true. Ah, that was what I was looking for. He created everything. But on day six, he created what? Animals. Dinosaurs, you're right. Yep. Uh, us, is that what you said? He created human beings. How many genders of human beings did God create? Two. And because there are two genders, God's definition of marriage is what? Mr. Gordy? One man, one woman for life. And also, as we are pursuing true success and going to heaven, what is the greatest pursuit in life? What is it, Mr. Daniel? Say it again. Fear God and keep his commandments. Fear God and keep his commandments. If you pursue those things, no matter what you do, you will be successful. So, very, very good. All right. You guys did good tonight. I'm very proud of you guys. You make up a really good 66 club. So, let's say a prayer, and then you guys can walk quietly back to sit down so we can start our worship. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you so much for the time that we have to be able to learn about you. Father, we thank you for all of our young people. Thank you for their energy, for their enthusiasm. We just thank you for the ability to look uh, upon them and to understand better what you, in a lot of ways, Father, expect of us in the, the trust that they have. And Father, we pray that you will watch over them, keep them safe, and we pray that you'll be with each of their families, their moms and dads, as they continue to train them and raise them according to your will. Father, be with us now as we enter into our worship to you, and we thank you for your son Jesus, and it's in his name we pray, amen. While they're sitting, just one quick, and as I talk to Wayne, Wayne Bell a little bit ago, and he did say that he is feeling better. Um, got back, went as he went to the hospital to get some things checked out this morning. They could not find anything wrong with the symptoms that he was, was dealing with, so they sent him home. And uh, he says he's feeling much better, but they didn't really have any answers other than they told him to stay out of the heat. And so that could possibly be part of what he's dealing with. So just keep, keep Wayne in your thoughts and prayers as he, they're trying to figure out what's going on. Go ahead and mark number 596. 596 will be the song of encouragement after Steve Lesson this evening. For the prayer of Steve Lesson, if you would be standing for number 877. 877.
sweet is the song I'm singing today. present this evening to give you thanks for all the many blessings that you send our way. We know that our existence itself is a blessing from you, that you have created this entire universe for our preparation to be with you someday. And we thank you for all those blessings that you give to us. Father, we're mindful of those that could not be with us tonight, those elderly and those who are shut in would uh, help us to uh, be an encouragement to them. Those who are overcoming uh, medical procedures, we just uh, ask that you be with those. Help us to minister unto them as to what is, might be appropriate for the occasion. We would ask in a special way to be with our brother Wayne with, with the procedures that he was taking and hope that all goes well with him. <coughs> and... Uh, we just ask that a special measure of your grace be given to all these that are not able to be with us. Our Father, we thank you for your word that we've studied tonight, that we can understand the, your love for us. We gain a greater insight of your love for mankind. We know that you love man so much that you were willing to uh, have Jesus to die on the cross on our behalf to put us back into a relationship with you. And we thank you for all these things. Our Father, we just ask that you would be with us, and guide us, and direct us, and forgive us of our wrongs, and always keep us in your care. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Please take it. <laughs> seat. I couldn't help but just I close my eyes while we sang that song. And listen, I was singing too, but I couldn't help just a smile on my face. Think about what we just sang. 
I'm redeemed. And what put the smile on my face is I hear my 12 year old, my 12 year old son next to me singing, I'm redeemed. I can hear Don over here singing bass, singing, I'm redeemed. I, it's just the, 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 the thought, the one thing that brings us together is what Christ did to redeem us all. We've been paid for. We've been bought with a price. That's why we're here. And uh, love that song. Tonight, we are looking at a couple of questions. I posted on Facebook the two that we would be looking at tonight. I think we're going to look at two tonight. We'll see how long it takes me to get through the first one. Because um, they both come from Genesis chapter 1. Both from the same individual asked both of these questions. And so I thought, well, we can, I did, as I started doing study into these, it's one of the great things about doing something like this where I put out and say, hey, if you got a question about something, what does something mean, let me know and I'll try to answer it. There's things that I've studied before and things that I, have, I think I have an answer for, but once I really start digging in and studying it in a way I've never studied it before, I don't realize how much I'm going to uncover about these things. And so um, I love it. And, uh, and so I hope that it's as beneficial for you as it is for me. The first question that we're going to look at tonight is, what does firmament mean? It's a question or a word that we see in, our, in the scriptures in Genesis chapter 1. Matter of fact, this comes from Genesis chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. This is the New American Standard that I am using, translation. And everywhere that you see the word expanse is where you will see in the, New King, in the King James, in the New King James, in the American Standard, where the word firmament is used. And so, the, uh, according to New American Standard, tells us, Then God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters which were below the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening and morning a second day. And yes, I forgot to underline one of the expanses. But that was where we would find that word firmament. Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. God made the firmament to separate the waters. Uh, the, uh, that which were below the, the firmament from those that were above the firmament. God called the firmament heaven. So that's what those other translations would read. So what is this word? Firmament, expanse. What is this referring to? Do we have any idea? Well, we can start by going back and looking at the Hebrew language itself. In the Hebrew, this is the word rakia. The word rakia, it's a word that has been translated into various versions. We go back to about 200 A.D. when the Latin Vulgate was translated into from the Greek into Latin. Um, that's what the Roman Catholics have used uh, for, uh, for a long time, still do. Uh, and they translated the word rakia as firmamentum in the Latin. And so what we see is when we find, when you notice the King James, the New King James, and the American Standard, they used the uh, Latin Vulgate uh, as part of what they referenced when they were translating those three translations of Scripture. So what they did was they just transliterated the Latin word. So when you see the word firmament, all it is is a transliterated, it's not the definition of a word, it's a transliteration where they just made an English word that sounded as much like the Latin word as possible, and that's where we got the word firmament. And so if we think about the word firmament itself, it almost gives the sense of something that is solid, something that is firm, it's kind of what the word sounds like. However, and I think we get part of that from the Greek translation into, uh, or the, the, sorry, the Hebrew translation into Greek, 
when they translated the Septuagint, so that was the Hebrew Old Testament, they translated into the Greek language, for some reason, they used this word, stereoma, for the word rakia. They translated rakia into this stereoma. It's kind of unknown why they chose this word in the Greek language. Because, and it, it's kind of thought, and there are several things within the Septuagint. When the Septuagint was being translated into Greek, it was, it was done in northern Africa. It was done in Egypt. Alexandria is where it was, where it was done. There is a great Egyptian influence on a lot of the words that are used in the Septuagint. And this is one of them. There was an idea, and it's kind of thought, that this word may have been influenced by the Egyptian belief that the heavens are a stone vault. And so that was the Egyptian belief, that heaven is a stone vault. This word stereoma kind of lends itself to that idea of heaven being a solid type of place of existence. So it's not really understood exactly why they use this word there to talk about this firmament, the rakia. Um, but if you put it all together, so over time, this is what's happened with the Hebrew word in different translations, different ways. When you put it all together, it kind of gives us the impression that the firmament is something that is referring to a solid dome or something that is surrounding the earth. I can remember growing up and reading this as a child thinking, oh, the firmament, that, that's kind of how I pictured it, was some kind of a, 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 a dome or, or something that surrounded the earth uh, at that time. And the, all of the history of the translation of this word is kind of what has l lended itself to us having that idea. Well, let's look at the word itself. Let's define it. Let's don't just transliterate it. The definition of rakia literally means to be stretched or to spread. Or it's even sometimes used <coughs> to refer to something that's beaten out. Like if you have a piece of metal that has been heated and you are hammering it and stretching it out with a hammer by beating it. That, that's what the word is in Hebrew, something that is stretched. So our word for firmament, our word for expanse, and that's why I believe the translations that use the word expanse, it's a little bit better for us to be able to understand it. It's expanding something, and that's more what the literal meaning of the word is. So what Genesis 1 is telling us is that God made something that divided the waters on the earth from the waters above the earth. He did something to expand, to grow, to create something that expanded and grew out that separated the two. That's literally what it's saying. Now there's another thing that comes into play here, and that's if we get to chapter 1 and verse 8. In Genesis 1, 8, it tells us that God called the expanse, God called the firmament, heaven. That's a pretty important thing piece of information when we're trying to understand what is the firmament. So technically, when this question was asked, I could have just said, well, in chapter 1 and verse 8, God said the firmament is heaven, period, end of question. That's the answer. That still doesn't help us understand it very much, though, does it? The Hebrew word for heaven that's used here is the word shamayim. So let's look at that for a moment. If God called the firmament heaven, what is meant by heaven? Well, in Scripture, there are actually three different ways that this word is used. So we see it used several times as the sky, the place where birds fly, the atmosphere, where the clouds are. Sometimes it's referred to as the, the shamayim, that heaven. Sometimes we see it referred to as outer space, where all the stars and the planets and everything are. Sometimes, in Scripture, it's also used to describe where God dwells. And so, 
it kind of makes a little bit more sense to us. Now, why have we always had this idea that God dwells up there? Have you ever thought about that? Where have we gotten that idea? Part of it could come from every time God speaks, it seems like it's coming from above, and we see it in Scripture. When an angel appears, usually they're coming from above from somewhere, so that probably lends to it a little bit as well. But there is nowhere in Scripture that tells us that God in heaven is up. Because it's a spiritual realm that has nothing to do with our directions of up or down or north or south or anything. And so, but this is probably a big part of that. Because the same word is used to describe the sky, outer space, and also the place where God resides. So that's probably the big, biggest reason why people think about God, heaven being up. But the problem is, the firmament, God called the firmament, or heaven. So which one of these is it? How do we know what God was referring to as the firmament, or the firmament as heaven? Well, context has to determine it. <laughs> Here's a problem. The context in Genesis chapter 1 doesn't really answer it for us. It doesn't help us out a whole lot. And what we end up finding ourselves in is a kind of this quandary of, I could make it refer to any of these, and I get a different definition of what the firmament is. So, that doesn't help either. So, as we look at some of the traditional views what firmament means, the expanse, what, what is it? The traditional creationist view, almost every commentary I read will, will uh, point to an idea like this, that the firmament is that God created the atmosphere. On day two of creation, the atmosphere that separated the water vapor that make up the clouds and the waters that we see on the earth. That's typically the easiest view and most simple view of the firmament, but he created something that separated the two. It doesn't say that he created the clouds. He created something that separated the waters. So that still leaves a little bit of a question in my mind as to what exactly did he create that separated the two. And so it doesn't maybe help explain everything pertaining to what Genesis 1 says. There have been some other theories, probably one of the most popular over the last 20 years or so, has been that the firmament was something that formed a water canopy. And when God separated the waters above the firmament and below the firmament, we have the waters on the earth, and the theory, the idea, is that God created a canopy of water that surrounded the entire earth. And some of the thoughts <coughs> that have kind of gone along with this are, to make it apply and fit what Scripture says, is that they look at other things pertaining to what happens in the book of Genesis. One of the things that they point to is that the greenhouse effect that would have been uh, created by all of this, that could explain the long lives of those people before the flood. 969 years. How did they live that long? Well, part of the explanation of this, what they say, if there was this dome of water that was surrounding the atmosphere of the earth, then the sun and its radiation and all of that would not have been able to penetrate and affect things like it does today. Therefore, potentially being able to allow humans and many other things to live much, much longer. That's part of the scientific theory behind if this was what, what God did with the firmament. This water canopy then, they would say, could this then have described what we see in Genesis chapter 7 <coughs> when Scripture says that the floodgates of the sky opened up? So we know that the fountains of the deep at the flood, they burst forth, and the floodgates of the sky, could it have been this, fir this firmament, this dome that was surrounding the earth that God poked a hole in it, and it opened up as well? 
and dumped all of that water that on the day, second day of creation he had separated from the earth. That's kind of been the theory, the idea behind a lot of this for a long time. And for about the last 20 years or so, or maybe even longer, it's, it's had some merit as far as a theory, an idea, possible that maybe that's what happened. It seems to fit some of the other things that we see in Scripture. However, scientifically, it is kind of weak. And as we talked about all through VBS, we don't just look at science, and we don't just look at Scripture. We look at how science and Scripture go together. The world wants us to believe that you have to pick one or the other. You either get science or you, gotta be, or, or, or you believe, believe Scripture. You can't do both. I'm sorry. But God created everything in the world that we study in science. And so I can look and see what God gave me in Scripture and then theorize, how did he do that? What did he do? Because I know that this is true. And so everything that I do to study scientifically, I've got to do to see, does it fit what this says? This is the litmus test. This is the standard. If I discover something that doesn't fit what this says, then I can guarantee you 100% of the time, whatever I discovered is wrong. Because God's word will always be consistent, will always be correct. So when we talk about this, scientifically, there have been some studies that have been done. Dr. Larry Vardaman, who is an atmospheric physicist, also a creation scientist, he was studying this theory of there being a dome of water that surrounded all of the earth above the atmosphere of the earth, protecting the earth, and, and uh, so he did some studies. What he did was he created a computer model, and he plugged in all of the different possibilities, all the different variants, all the different uh, figures of, of what, according to his understanding, would have been present before the flood, is what he was looking at. And so what would happen if there was a dome of water like that that surrounded the earth, taking in the strength of the sun, taking in the way that water would reflect the radiation of the sun, taking in all kinds of things, the greenhouse effect and everything that he could possibly think of, all of those variables. His conclusion was that with a dome of water like that around the earth, everything on planet earth would have heated up to such an intensity that everything would have boiled and died. Human flesh would have boiled and died. And he tried to change things. He checked all kinds of different variables. He, had, he tweaked it and tried all kinds of different things to try to make it work. And he realized scientifically it can't work. The only way he was able to make Earth survivable with a dome of water surrounding it is if he lowered the intensity of the sun to 25%. So just a fourth of its normal regular strength, which we know that wasn't a thing. So the conclusion it came to scientifically was that just really can't work. So that theory that had been around for a long time, it pretty much has, um, uh, most have abandoned it because it just, just doesn't seem like that's possible. So we're still left with, so what in the world was the firmament? Well, there's another theory that has come about since that, this time. And this is that maybe when he said that he called the firmament heaven, maybe it was the second definition of heaven that was being referred to. Maybe it was outer space that was being referred to. Now here is the reasoning, biblical reasoning, behind it. In the context of Genesis chapter 1, the word rakia is used many times. Firmament, the word rakia. We see it in Genesis 1, in verse 17. God placed the stars, he says, in the heavens. He placed the stars in rakia. So it's right here in the same chapter, and God is using rakia to refer to where the stars and the planets, the sun, the moon, everything else is located. At the same time, here in Genesis chapter 1, when it talks about the birds that were created, it says 
I believe if you read, and in, in, I didn't put the verse down here, but when you read it, it says that they were flying in the heavens. Well, that's not a real literal translation of the Hebrew. A literal translation of the Hebrew says that they were flying across the face of the rocky eye the firmament, the heavens. And so, as they're flying across the face of it, it's not the same as if they're flying in it. So that's another thing that they point to, that maybe it's not referring to where the birds and the clouds are, but the birds are flying across the face of something, which could be outer space, in that outer atmosphere. Here's some other reasoning that they have behind this. They say making the waters above the Rakia would then be saying that those waters are on the outskirts of the universe. Now, is there any way for us to test that? Nope. We can't even see the outskirts of the universe. But this is kind of this is where the theory has led, is that the waters that were separated, that there's waters on Earth. Waters on the outskirts of the universe as a whole. They say, this is scientifically speaking, this could explain part of why the stars are accelerating outward. Because in Genesis 1 it says that God, the word rakia literally means expanded. That it's spread out. And this could be part of the explanation as to why the universe is expanding why all the stars are moving away from each other and they are accelerating. How does that happen? It could only happen if the hand of God had done something to pull them to do what they're doing. There's no other way that it can be explained. And so it is as though they were being stretched or pulled out by some kind of force. Now, is there any way for us to prove that that's what the firmament is? No, there's not. So, the answer to the question. We don't know. We're not completely sure. There are theories. There are ideas. I think the traditional view is a safe place to land. Where God separated the waters that are in the atmosphere and the clouds and the waters that are on the earth. It's a pretty safe place to go. There's still some questions as to what was actually created that separated them. But that's probably a pretty safe place to be. But although all of these different things, all of the different ideas that are out there, researchers are testing all kinds of various models and theories and hypothesis and all kinds of things that they're doing to try to scientifically show that what the Bible says could absolutely be accurate. And so, in doing so, they try many different ideas. But the basic Bible facts never change. And that's what Moses said in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 11. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. That's the truth. That is exactly what happened. It is not possible for us to prove creation. It's not possible, the way that the Bible describes it, other than look around at the evidence. The evidence points to exactly what the Bible says, but it's not scientifically possible to prove it. The only way something can scientifically be proven is if you can witness it happening. There was nobody there to witness it happening except for God himself. And so that's the same thing with evolution. They say it is a fact. It has been proven. It's impossible. It's impossible to prove it because you would have to witness the theory in action as they say it happened, which nobody has ever done. And so don't go to somebody and say, but science proves that creation was, was, was accurate. It actually doesn't. However, the evidence overwhelmingly points to, to creation and what the Bible says rather than the theories of a godless evolution like the world wants us to believe. What time have I got? I've got time. Question number two. So I've left you all with probably more questions than you started with when it comes to the firmament. 
That's all right. Just write it on a piece of paper and say, okay, so what did that mean? <clears throat> Question number two. In Genesis chapter 1, we have a statement that is made where it says, and God said, let us make man in our image. What does the let us mean? The secondary question that came with this was, is this referring to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? And so that's what we want to look at. To begin with, we know the way that the Bible depicts God. First of all, it depicts God that there is only one God. Scripture after Scripture. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. I am the Lord. There is no other. Besides me, there is no God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, Yet for us, there is but one God. 1 Timothy 2, For there is one God. In James chapter 2, You believe that God is one, and you do well. Scripture depicts very clearly, There is only one God. But at the same time, Scripture very clearly depicts that God is three in one. And so we have a picture here that kind of helps to define and describe it, where you have God being one God. We know there is only one God. But at the same time, we know that the Father is God. We also know from Scripture that the Son is is God. We also know that the Holy Spirit is God. But at the same time, we also know that the Father is not the Son. So in John 8 and verse 16, it says, but even if I do, this is Jesus speaking, even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone in it, but I and the Father who sent me. Very clearly, Jesus and his Father who sent him are not the same thing. We also know from what Scripture tells us that the Father and the Holy Spirit are not the same, the same person. So in John chapter 14 and verse 26, again, Jesus says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name... He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. So in this one, we see all three. We see that the Father is going to send the Holy Spirit, so they are not the same person, although they are both God. We also know from what Scripture tells us that the Holy Spirit is not the Son. In Acts chapter 10, in verse 38 we also see it is 38, isn't it? this is Peter when he's speaking to the house of Cornelius he says you know of Jesus of Nazareth how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with uh, and with power and how he went about doing good and healing all who are oppressed so there again we see all three but Jesus he, uh, God anointed him with the Holy Spirit. Three different personalities, one God. We, of course, have come to know this as the Trinity, as the three in one. It is referred to sometimes as the Godhead. Uh, and so this is the picture that we're given. I think sometimes we do this a little bit of a disservice. We kind of, in our minds, try to separate God like when Jesus was here on earth, that part of God was on earth and part of God was still in heaven and part of God was the Spirit that was kind of just all over the place. And that's not really the right idea of God. God is not something that is just broken into pieces and scattered about. God is one. And in saying that, you're probably waiting to say, okay, so give us a better explanation to understand that completely. What does that mean? I don't know. And the reason that I don't know is because God is unique. 
God is different than anything else. And what we try to understand with our mind is not going to be what God is. He gives us as many glimpses and pictures as he possibly can for our finite minds to grasp and understand who he is. But there's still no possible way. Now, we can still see some things in Scripture go along with this. We see at Jesus' baptism is another example of the three all that are appear at the same time. So then we see the Son, Jesus, was in human form. We see the Father spoke to the Son from heaven. We see the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus as a dove. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. All three separate entities, but all still God. We see them mentioned together. You're baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We see Paul say in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, he is in a prayer, offers a prayer for the Corinthian church and says that he, he wishes that they would receive the grace of Jesus, their Lord, the love of the Father, and the blessings of the Spirit. So we see all three different, different things, different parts of God that are all working together as one. Now, we go back to our passage in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. When we look at this, we see, I don't think anybody argues the fact that God the Father was involved in creation event. That's pretty much a given. But what about the Holy Spirit and the Son? Well, if we look in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2, we see the Holy Spirit. Where it tells us, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the water. So the Spirit is seen in the creation event. The question then is, well, what about the Son? A lot of times we want to say, what about Jesus? He wasn't Jesus until he became a human baby on earth that God told Mary and Joseph to name Jesus. So at this point, he is the Son of God. Another deeper study you may say, be able to say he was the angel of the Lord. Whenever you see the phrase, the, not an angel of the Lord, but the angel of the Lord, it looks like in the Old Testament that that's most likely pointing to the Son and his involvement throughout the Old Testament as well. It's another, another study for another time. So what about the Son during creation? It doesn't say, and the Son was there doing such and such. But there is a phrase that we see seven times, I think says more than we give it credit for. Seven times it tells us in Genesis chapter 1, then God said. What, what does that have to do with the Son? Well, how does the Apostle John open his gospel? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him. And apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. So in the beginning, going back to Genesis chapter 1, was the Word. And the Word was not only with God, the Word was God. But the two of those together, that's interesting. He was with God and was God at the same time. Does that go back to our picture of God is one, he is God, but there are also three, he was with God. How do you explain that and understand it? I don't know, but that who is who our God is. How do we know who is this word, who was with God and was God? Well, you drop down to verse 14 in John 1, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Okay? who was the Word, who above tells us was with God and is God. Do we have any idea of God who came and dwelt among us and became flesh? Yeah, we do. It goes on, And we saw His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Do we have any inclination as to who the only begotten of the Father is? For God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son. 
the Word is the Son. Okay. John also told us in, in verse 3 that all things that came into being through Him, nothing that was created was created without the Word, without Jesus. So John just told us Jesus was there. I link that to, and God said. When God spoke the Word, the Word of God is, in essence, the Son of God. When God said, let there be light, it was the Son, the Word, who was creating light. Nothing came into being, not even light, without the Word. Jesus was an integral part of the creation event. And so with all of that information, we look at that question again. What does the let us? When we get to verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image. I believe, as I said, the secondary question is, are we looking at the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit? You are absolutely looking at the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You have God, which is interesting the way it's written in the Hebrew. God said, singular, let us make man in our image, plural. In the very first chapter of the Bible, you have the first glimpse of the one God and the three different aspects and parts, the personalities of what the Godhead does and is involved in. Explain it all? I can't. Someday, when we're standing before the throne of God, come ask me again. I think I'll have a better answer. But we do know again, we do know, and we can determine very clearly, I believe, that this reference of the plurality in verse 26 is definitely speaking of all three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, because we know they were all there, of course. Again, do you see how we say that? I'm saying it almost as though there were three different people who all showed up for the party. God is one. If God was there, they were there. And that is the uniqueness of our God. So I hope, I hope that helps for the question that was asked. Give a little bit of understanding. So next time, somebody give me a question that actually has an answer. And... Uh, I can be more satisfied because now I got to dig more to see if I can find a better answer. I hope I hope that lessons like this. I hope I hope it's good. I hope it's helpful. I think what is the firmament? What is this? Is that really important for us to know? Maybe the answer to the question is not something that's a life and death salvation issue. But look at what we got to do. We got to dig in the Word. We got to try to understand better what does God say? What did he mean? And to help us to understand those things, that will help us in further study to be able to determine just exactly that's what he said about that thing back in Genesis chapter 1. We have to be consistent and apply it the same way somewhere else. And so it helps us in our study to be able to know how to dig and how to, to find answers. And so I hope that it is, is beneficial in that way for you. It definitely has been for me because I get to do the work and uh, share it all with you. If there is a need tonight of any kind in any way, if there is one that has a need to come before the, the church tonight, whatever the burden may be that is on you, whatever you need, the prayers. We talk about the prayers. That almost becomes cliche. It's very important. But it's more of the hugs and the, just the acknowledgement and the love that you will receive from those that are around you tonight. If that's something that's needed, will you let us know? If there's someone tonight that's ready, we're talking about an amazing God, what he has done. And if you have not submitted your life to him, the God that created everything that is great and beautiful and wonderful has also revealed to us what is horrible and terrible if we do not follow him. 
And that's something not even God himself wants any to see. He doesn't want any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. If you have not given your life to Jesus Christ, if you have not clothed yourself with Christ by putting him on in baptism, becoming a new child of God, would you do that? Come and serve this amazing God that created everything that's around us. If there is any need, you can do that tonight if you'll come forward as we stand and sing. front row during the singing of this song will be served after this song. Number 100 will sing verses 1 and 3.
have those tonight partaking of this, remember, this is still a together thing. That's why it's offered Sunday evening. It's not a time for even the rest of our minds to be wandering and thinking about we're almost done. But this is a together thing. It's about the sacrifice that Christ has made to draw all of us together. And so as those partaking of it tonight, as they are focusing on that, we need to make sure that we're doing the same as well. If you'll bow with me as we give thanks for the bread. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the beautiful day that we've had and a day that we hope has been pleasing to you in the way that we have focused on you and focused on each other, focused on your word. Father, we understand and know that the primary focus of this day is your son and his death and burial and resurrection, that resurrection, that, that event that changed the world. We pray, Father, that now as we remember that sacrifice, partaking of this memorial of the bread, that we can try to understand just, just how tragic the event was for him at the same time that he understood and knew just how victorious that event was for all the rest of us. We thank you for that sacrifice that he gave of giving his body. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Bow. Father, as, as we conclude this time of memorial tonight, we can't help but picture the drops of blood that were shed through the sacrifice of, of your son. Father, the lamb that was slain for us, that punishment, the beating, and most especially the death that was our penalty for our sin. But through his blood being shed, Father, you had made the promise to cleanse all of us who have accepted that gift and will have been obedient to your gospel call. And Father, we can never thank you enough. We do Thank you for that sacrifice and the love that was shown through your son, Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Close with number 732. Seven hundred and thirty-two. We'll stand for the prayer in just a moment. Abide with me.
God, we thank you for giving us this day. We thank you for sustaining us through this day. God, you teach us that we cannot live without you. And you also teach us that, uh, that you sustain us not only in this physical world, but also spiritually. Please, God, help us to rely on you completely and understand that you are our creator and our God. Be with us as we go through this week. Help us to prove to be two chil true children of yours, faithful, wholehearted, true-hearted, and show that love for you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.